<laughs> yes, you know more than me in running the church. No, 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 absolutely not. How do I know that? Because they're absolutely pure. They're absolutely virtuous. They're absolutely loyal to God. And how do I know that? Because they were tested like we are, and that test sealed them forever in his service. So there is nothing that, there's no, there's no turning back on that, ever. And this is why the fallen angels are irredeemable. Because when they fell, they fully knew what they were doing and the consequence of their action. They knew what they were doing and they knew what the consequence would be and yet they did it anyway. So they do know right and wrong. Of course they do. Never chose wrong. Right. Yes. Yes. The difference between angels and men is that when Adam and Eve sinned, they did not have a full understanding of what their consequences were going to be. I mean, they knew God said they had died, but they had no idea what, what all of that meant. They couldn't have. Otherwise, they wouldn't have done it. No. Uh, in fact, he was behind the whole crucifixion idea. Uh, the idea of killing God, the idea of just destroying Jesus, that was going to be the end of it. Um, I, the scripture said, had they known, had they known what they were doing, they would have never crucified him in the beginning. They would have just let him, let him alone. The whole idea of Jesus coming and allowing himself to be crucified, allowing, did you hear what I said? Allowing you know why I say that? Because Jesus said, no man takes my life. No, no, no. No man takes my life from me. I lay it down. I will bring it up again. I have this by commandment from the Father. Do you understand that? No one took Jesus by surprise. He knew exactly what was going to happen. He told them what was going to happen to them. I'm going to die, guys, and I'm going to come back again in three days. And the only people that believed him were his enemies. The disciples didn't believe it. Did they? No. And I'm sure the devil didn't fully understand what was going on. Sure. Because Colossians says... If they, if the principalities and powers had known, they would have never crucified him. They just did not. This is, the mystery of salvation is a mystery that the angels don't fully get. So I'm glad I'm in good company. You know, the angels don't fully understand this. Um, a good verse of that is in 1 Peter 1. Hebrews, James, 1 Peter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. Uh, verse 10. The prophets who prophesied of the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired about this salvation. They inquired what person or time was indicated by the Spirit of Christ within them when they were predicting the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glory. Peter is saying that the prophets of the Old Testament who prophesied that Jesus was coming, they tried to figure out what was going on. They tried to understand this, but they couldn't piece it all together. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you. So the prophets understood that this is not for us to understand. It's some future time. Okay? Uh, serving them at you in the things which have now been announced to you by those who preach the good news to you through the Holy Spirit sent for heaven things into which angels long to look 
Did you hear that? Peter says that the angels are, are astounded by this whole business of salvation. I mean, it blows their mind. It's like, wow. And it was said it was out of envy that the devil tempted Adam and Eve. Remember that in the Book of Wisdom, chapter 1? It was out of envy. Well, what was he envious about? Well, some theologians have speculated that God announced his plan of salvation before he created Adam and Eve, that he was going to make man, he was going to make him in his image, he was going to do this, and that the angels would serve men as a higher creation than they are. And that's what was the devil's envy. He didn't like that idea. He said, I'm not going to serve them. And God said, that was his disobedience. And so this whole idea that God himself would condescend, take on flesh, and redeem mankind is something that baffled the angels. Why would that happen? Why would you do that for these, these animated clay figures that you made? Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, an angel is so much more powerful, more, much more virtuous, so much more glorious. Why? And it's like, because God <coughs> built it. God loved us so much that he sent his son to <coughs> God. That whoever would believe would not perish but have everlasting life. I mean, it's a powerful thing. <coughs> And one could argue that the reason that what was the motivation of God's love for us is out of mercy, out of pity. Because Adam and Eve, like I said, were like children. They were fully human or grown, but they hadn't had any life experience. It was like they were children. So they didn't fully understand the consequence of their action. The angels did. Again, this is our faith. The angels fully understood what they were doing when either they chose to follow God or chose not to follow Him, and that forever sealed their fate. And the angel, the fallen angels themselves know at one time, this is all going to come to an end. This is all, this is all, it's all over. It's just a matter of time to bring it all to an end. They know they're doomed. They know it. They're, 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 it, it's it, bag it and tag it. It's over. They know it. The devil knows it. It's over. God has won. It's just, a, it's just now playing it out in human history before it all comes to an end. And to me, that's the mystery, uh, amongst other things, about the angels. It's like, why, if I were a fallen angel, I would just go, you know what, this is, this is, this is, stupid. You know, I'm, I'm done. I'm done. I'm not going to get anywhere. I might as well quit. You know, if I can't win, I'm not going to play the game. That's what I would do. Right? Are you going to play a game that you can't win? You know you're not going to win. Okay, let's play a game of chess. You will lose. Let's go. <laughs> I'm not going to play. <laughs> Right? It's over. <laughs> the devil knows it's over. It's over, my brothers and sisters. It's over. Jesus is one. Jesus is Lord. This Jesus whom you have crucified, God has made both Lord and Christ. By the resurrection of the dead. That's what Peter said on the first sermon of the church. Do you hear that? God has made him both Lord and Christ. It's over. Well, then why all the drama? Because they have nothing else. These are creatures filled with rage and frustration, I imagine, because they can't do anything. <clears throat> that A, God doesn't allow, and B, it's, it's, it's done. When Jesus encountered the demoniac of Gadara, 
in the gospel. The demons cried out in the man, What have you to do with us, Son of God? Have you come to torment us before our time? They even know that there's a time set that this is all going to be. They know this. And so when they encountered Jesus here walking on the earth, they said, have you come to torment us before their time? They recognized who he was. They knew who he was. Do you understand that? The disciples didn't. The demons did. They knew exactly who he was. And they said, have you come to torment us before our time? And, and, and Jesus said, just shut up and get out. <laughs> That basically, that's the chip translation of that verse. He said, shut up and get out. And, they, and guess what they did? They went into the pigs, and the pigs went crazy and went over the hill. And the man was freed immediately. Jesus has power over the enemy. All of the enemy. Do you understand that? He is Lord. And all, all will bow the knee. All in heaven, all on earth, all under the earth. Every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. So, as dark as it may get down here, as terrible things, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Jesus is Lord. And a good way to help promote that is to go see the movie about St. Faustina. I mean, Jesus, I trust you. That's all we have to fall on, because he is Lord. So, I remember where I left off last week. I was going over these scriptures about how God, these are primarily scriptures about husband and wife relationships. Primarily that. I know I went over Corinthians. I want to jump to Ephesians. Ephesians is one of these. This section, I will come back again when we, when we talk about women because the two are interchangeable in this passage. I would underline or star, put a bookmark in here that you always want to come back to this. I think it's the, it's the best section to come back to in terms of the relationship between men and women. It's primarily written for husbands and wives. Okay? But nevertheless, it is a relationship between men and women. And it begins, underline this verse, be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. Did you hear that? Be subject to one another. Serve one another. Esteem one another greater than you out of reverence for Christ. That is the overarching principle in this passage. You got it? Because when you start reading the other stuff, you have this tendency to get <gasps> like this and go, oh, and you get offended. You know. When it says, wives, be subject to your husbands as to the Lord. I beg your pardon. <laughs> right? That's your first reaction, right? Uh -huh. No. I ain't gonna, no. No man ain't going to tell me what to do. <laughs> Wrong, right? What is the overarching principle? We are to be submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. In the Christian community that Paul is writing to, that is how we are to treat one another. Okay? In saying, wives, be subject to your husbands as to the Lord, because the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body. Okay? As the church is subject to Christ, the so wives be subject in everything to their husbands. You see the analogy that Paul is establishing? 
We have a, an obligation to be in subject to Christ, the head of the church. He is, what he says goes. He is God, and that's that. You don't like it? There's the door. Don't let it hit you on the way out. Right? Now again, it's not that kind of, you know, love it or, you know, or, or leave it kind of idea. If you're, you are doing this in terms of a love relationship. Christ is not some sort of mean taskmaster to us. He is our loving spouse, our loving husband, and we are his church. And he loves us so much, our natural response is to do what he tells us. Out of gratitude, out of love back to him. Do you hear what I'm saying? So it's not like he's hitting us over the head. He's not an abusive husband. You know, you don't do what I say, well, I'm going to smack you upside the head. Right? No. It's this understanding that we submit to God because he is our loving, heavenly father. He is our loving spouse, our husband, if you will. And I know this is difficult for men to get into, but women gravitate to it very easily because that's kind of natural for them. But men have a harder time getting it because it's out of place. Okay? And what I would advise is looking at the male mystics, St. Bernard, St. John of the Cross, St. Alred, St. Um, who's another great mystic? male mystic, um, St. Ignatius of Loyola, all of them talk about the kind of relationship that men have with Christ in this spousal relationship. Okay? Women mystics have a great relationship with this because they get married to Christ. They talk about it as a mystical marriage. Okay? And so that's what is being stated here. So wives submit to their husbands 